Hello, uh, Rajiv Sethi. Uh, very good to be with you. This is Glenn Lowry at bloggingheads.tv, The Glenn Show. Also professor of economics at Brown University. I'm talking with my friend and colleague and collaborator, uh, the economist Rajiv Sethi of Barnard College, Columbia University, um, who is here. Uh, and thank you for joining us, Rajiv. Oh, it's a pleasure to be here, Glenn. He's here uh, to uh, speak with me about the topic of the day, uh, the issue du jour. Uh, which is what's going on with police killings and race in the country. I've had a number on the Glenn Show recently of uh, other guests, Peter Moskos, the sociologist who teaches at John Jay College uh, at, in New York City, Heather McDonald, uh, the acerbic uh, conservative uh, writer at the Manhattan Institute uh, in New York City also, uh, and, um, and others, Harold Pollock at the University of Chicago, and we've been talking about this, so this is a conversation that's ongoing at the Glenn Show. Okay, so uh, Rajiv has been kind enough to give me a minute to introduce the question, and here's the question I'd like to take up with him, and uh, I welcome Rajiv to contribute other thoughts and ideas, but that, the question I have in mind is this. It seems to me that the crux of the matter with the uh, instances of Alton Sterling in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, shot in the back while he's laying on the ground with uh, with uh, uh, Philando Castile in Falcon Heights, Minnesota, uh, shot while uh, he is apparently reaching to identify himself in a situation where he needn't have been posing any threat to police officer, killed. Um, the question that I think is behind the activism and the, the anger and the sense of injury uh, that is felt not only in, uh, among African Americans, but certainly fervently so among African Americans that the president has given uh, voice to. The question is uh, whether these events uh, are instances of uh, racial bias, of the police having acted in a way differently than they would have acted if the subject, uh, the victim of these uh, uh, lethal actions by police had not been black. It seems to me that that's the question. Linking this all of this to the long history of race uh, conflict uh, and racial uh, oppression of African Americans in the country, linking it to that embodies implicitly this question. So forgive me for this long introduction. The reason that I've asked to have this conversation with Rajiv is because he's an expert economist, social scientist, um, looking at the literature and doing research on the very question of uh, how race interacts with uh, other social forces to produce various kinds of outcomes, including uh, the police use of deadly force. Um, and there is this study that has been uh, much discussed by Roland Fryer, the economist at Harvard, a uh, big piece in the New York Times on the front page. Roland Fryer, one of the attendees at the president's five-hour meeting with uh, law enforcement uh, uh, activists and uh, others, elected officials in the White House and so forth and so on. Roland Fryer has a study um, which has uh, been examining evidence addressing this question of whether the police are racially biased in the instances in which they're using deadly force. Rajiv uh, has been uh, commenting uh, critically on the background research that is reported on in that New York Times piece that is represented in Roland Fryer's study and other sources of evidence. Uh, and uh, I wanted us to be able to engage the social science question, you know, how would we use evidence to identify uh, uh, with confidence uh, the answer to that hypothetical question if the victims had been uh, white, would the outcome have been different? So uh, again, with thanks for your allowing me to go on for um, what looks like four minutes, Rajiv. Uh, no, that, I'd like to turn the floor over to you, having introduced that. And maybe you want to describe role of study. Maybe you want to talk about your reactions to it. Maybe you want to engage this question at a more general level. Uh, but I, I'd certainly like to hear from you about this. No, that's uh, the, the way you framed the question is exactly, I think, uh, the right place to start, which is whether or not in any particular interaction, such as the Castile shooting, um, how, whether it would have played out differently had the, the driver in that incident been white with a girlfriend next to him and a child in the back um, and other incidents of that of that kind because I think it's the it's the you know the suspicion of bias in treatment that is really animating the Black Lives Matter movement uh, rather than any particular statistics um, and and 
uh, and and you, as you said, it's very important to try to think about how one might establish one way or the other the answer to this question in a convincing way. Now, you mentioned that you had a conversation with Peter Moskos on your on your blog um, yes. on, on on blogging heads, and actually Peter uh, uh, keeps a record of what he calls bad shootings on his blog, as you know. And on the Castile incident, he was unequivocal. He, he said he didn't think there was a chance in hell that this would have happened had the driver been white. And there's something that is leading him to that uh, conclusion. Now, he is a former officer um, uh, in Baltimore City. He's a sociologist. Um, and so he's using all kinds of information that we can't necessarily okay. articulate. But he's coming to that conclusion based on something, some, some experience. My, mind you now, uh, briefly... He also is of the view that the Alton Sterling shooting in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, probably was not a bad shoot. Yes, I, 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 my understanding is that he wants to reserve judgment on that one, that right. there isn't enough evidence for, for him to make a, make a decision. But he's quite unequivocal about the Castile shooting. But what was interesting about his comment on the Castile shooting is that he linked it to an earlier shooting in 2004 in South Carolina of a motorist, LeVar Jones, uh, by a South Carolina trooper called Sean Grubert which was uh, fortunately non-fatal. But there's a very clear dash cam video of that. And, and that incident is recorded, you know, with much cl- much greater clarity. The actual, you know, the, the, the incidents that led up to the shooting, the shooting itself, and then what followed it. And so that's a much clearer example. And again, he is uh, um, he's, he's quite unequivocal that that also would not have occurred had, uh, had, the, driver in the, uh, had the driver in question in that incident uh, uh, been white. And what, you know, what was striking to me was that I, I, in my own mind, I linked these two incidents right away. And in fact, I wrote about this on my blog. Um, and then so did others. Josh Marshall, in fact, uh, uh, at Talking Points Memo, did the same thing. He linked these two incidents. So there's something about this. There's some evidence there um, that we are processing in some way to come to this kind of judgment. Now, your well, if, if I may, uh, just about this, and you can incorporate your response into whatever you were going on to say, which is, those are two instances in the context of a thousand people or so being killed in a year, 250 or so of them being black. So are those particular, even if true, instances in which the outcome would have been different if the subject dispositive, you know, relative to the general structure of the interactions that we're observing? They are only two uh, cases after all. Th- that is correct. They are only two cases. Um, you know, most of the other cases um, well, you have you have cases in which uh, that's right. You you, you can look at uh, cases in which uh, the police have acted, um, you know, in, in ways that that Peter Moskos would describe as bad shootings. There's there's like one McDonald. There's uh, there's other cases, but I'm particularly interested in these two cases because. The way in which I interpret what happened is an exaggerated fear of violence on the part of the driver. That's not what we saw with Laquan McDonald. Um, that's not what we saw in the Scott case, you know, where, where, which seemed more like executions, actually, right. like cold-blooded executions. Right. But the reason why I, uh, I personally felt that race was a factor in these two cases was because I've been looking at the way in which you know, stereotypes of this kind, stereotypes of black male violence feed into interactions in the criminal justice system at all kinds of different levels, you know, especially with regard to robbery and homicide. And we can get into this uh, later, but, the, you know, one of the reactions, especially with uh, uh, people like Heather McDonald, is, well, you know, the, the, the frequency of police shootings of African-Americans is roughly comparable to arrest rates, crime rates, and so on, and right. they often point to violent crime Right. And uh, they have in mind robbery, homicide, aggravated assault. Right. And I hope we get a chance to talk about this because, because um, you know, stereotypes actually come into play in, in affecting the incidence of these crimes also uh, in ways that I feel are consistent with my reading of, this, uh, of the evidence in these two cases. So, for example, with regard to robbery, um, with regard to robbery, you have very, very striking facts. It's absolutely true that there's an overrepresentation of African Americans in arrests. Uh, about 50% of robbery arrests are of black men. Um, but at the same time, you have other other patterns. So you have, for example, black offenders in robbery are roughly equal opportunity. They, they have about half their victims are, are white and about half are black. Whereas white robbers have victims 
that are almost overwhelmingly white. So about 40% of robberies are white on white. So there's a lot of white offenders out there, but they seem to avoid black victims. Yeah. Why do they avoid black victims? So in part, my reading of that, and this is based on work that I've done with Dan O'Flaherty, yeah. is, the, is exactly the fear of black male violence. They, they, if, you know, they, want to, they want to avoid being resisted and being hurt in that kind of situation. Yeah. Um, why, do, uh, why, do, why do black offenders seek out white victims, again, <laughs> to exploit well, because they anticipate that the white victims will anticipate that because they're black, et cetera. I would like to get more into this, but I want not to lose track of the essential question that we were posing at the start. Yeah, so if I can just finish my thought. So sure. The, uh, that since this kind, of, uh, this kind of stereotype is pervasive in other kinds of interactions that I've looked at, um, it, it would be surprising to me if police were immune from it. Um, that that's my you know I'm just telling you where I'm coming from. Okay, so, no, this, this is good, and and uh, I think we should, and I, we have plenty of time. We'll come back to uh, looking more seriously at the stereotype question, which, as you know, I have my own uh, professional interests. Um, but but I I want to stay on this issue of the answer to the counterfactual. If the victim of the police shooting had not been black, they wouldn't have been killed. Because to the extent that the answer to that question is yes, as a generalizable fact about policing in America, that is what is driving Black Lives Matter and other protests. And that's what's giving fuel to the anger that the president has been insisting. We need to understand where it's coming from in the black community. And as social scientists, we need to parse the evidence in the context of Roland Fryer's study and whatever other evidence is at hand. And the thing I want to put to you, Rajiv, we're both statistically trained uh, social scientists, is uh, I once served on a National uh, Academy of Sciences committee about evaluating uh, evidence on discrimination. And there was a very good statistician from uh, Carnegie Mellon, uh, Steve something, uh, uh, Gelman or something like that, his name will come to me momentarily, who took the following stance. The only way that we can give a scientific answer to that question is to conduct the experiment in which we control the racial identity of the person subject to otherwise exactly identical conditions, and we then evaluate whether or not the frequency of the event in question is different under the uh, exogenous imposition through control of variation in the racial identity. That's the only way we can answer that question. Right. Any other inference from evidence is problematic, argued this right. person, to giving the answer to the causal question. Because no one has a parallel universe, okay? We can't actually redo the Alton Sterling or the Philando Castile in parallel universe. We don't have the evidence. So all we have to, we have what evidence we have. We're going to make what inferences we're going to make, but they'll never be able to identify the causal effect. That's his, that's his claim. And I want yeah. you to address that. I, I want you yeah. to move from the video evidence that you were giving attention to just a moment ago uh, and talk about police motives and whatnot to address the general question uh, in the context of Roland Fryer's study or in any other context that you would care to. Of, yeah. uh, how would you answer uh, that statistical critique? Uh, surely looking at differences in the means of, you know, let's look at the people who were killed unarmed and let's look at the people who were killed and who were armed. Let's yeah. see that there's a higher rate of blacks being among the killed people in the unarmed subpopulation of those killed than in the armed population. Let's just say hypothetically that that's so. I believe that actually happens to be the case. But I think that, you and I can agree that that does not answer. I mean, that's open to all kinds of, you know, speculations about causality, yeah. but it's not it's not definitively identifying any kind of causal effect. So I, I want to know what what's the evidence that we've got? What's the evidence we need to have? How do you read the evidence in hand and so forth? Okay, so I think that's, you know, as a logical point, this is correct, that, you know, unless you can run the experiment and, and you know, control everything except the race of the individuals involved, you can't get a conclusive answer, an answer that is, you know, beyond all reasonable doubt. But that doesn't mean that other forms of evidence are irrelevant. Um, one but I want you to answer the question about how will we identify the effect. I'm not saying any particular evidence is or is not relevant. Excuse me for interrupting, but I don't want to lose track of the question. Well, in, you know, in the case of traffic stops and so on, you have exactly the audit studies of the kind you have in mind, right? You, you, you switch the race of the driver. You have, you have this with the resume study, uh, Bertrand and Mulanathan for, for job applications and so on. Now, you can't do this for police shootings because you can't put your experimental subjects at risk. Um, you know, you can't, 
you know, obviously the experiment that the statistician has in mind can't be run. So if that's if that's the only evidence that you think is acceptable, you're not going to get there. No, no, I, I understand we're not going to get it. And therefore, given the evidence at hand, including the video evidence, if you like, but I'm especially interested in uh, your reaction to the study that's gotten such attention that Fryer has put out. Right. I mean, what is the possibility and what are the limitations on the okay. data that are in hand in drawing an inference about that question? And what data okay. would, what data that's feasible to get would allow us? I mean, I'm not even sure that in yes. principle you can answer the question uh, definitively well, with the data well, at hand. Well, what, what Fryer has done in the study is the, is the right place to start because he's collecting a set of interactions, which, you know, which is, which he calls his arrest pool. So these are interactions which he thinks uh, could lead to the legitimate use of force. Uh, and this is from the city of Houston. And uh, uh, compares this to, uh, to the interactions that did result in the discharge of a weapon by the, uh, by the officer. So this is his shooting pool. And the first thing he looks at is looks at the racial composition of these two pools. So he finds 58% of those in the arrest pool uh, were black, and 52%, I believe, maybe, maybe 53, were in the shooting pool were black. And so the arrest pool has a larger black share than the shooting pool. And that's actually, that's actually the, you know, the finding that he describes as startling in his paper. Um, Can I just observe that that would imply blacks are slightly less likely to be shot conditional upon being arrested than are non-blacks? Per, per encounter, correct. If, if you think about if you think about the arrest pool as the set of encounters which could potentially result in a shooting right. and the shooting pool as the set of encounters that actually did, then that's the inference you would draw. Of course, uh, uh, of course, these two pools are actually not very closely connected. They're, they're, you know, not all the shootings arise from an incident Understood. that would found its way in the arrest pool and so on. Um, so that's the first place he looks. But then, of course, the next step, and again, he's aware of this. He's a, you know, he's a, a first-rate economist. Um, he, uh, the, the next step is to, is to look at the arrest pool and to try to see whether the interactions are in some way different. Um, you know, whether or not when the police, you know, the, the blacks in the arrest pool are somehow different than the whites in the arrest pool in behavioral or contextual characteristics. Did the, did the interaction occur at night or during the day? Yeah. You know, was there an attempt to attack uh, uh, the police officer? Was there a weapon and so on and so forth? Right. And uh, so he has data on these things. And if you just look at that data in the arrest pool, and this is what made me a little bit skeptical of the study to begin with. If you look at the data in the arrest pool, you see quite clearly that the white and black samples in the arrest pool are indeed quite different. So you find about two thirds of whites are reported as having attacked uh, or drawn a weapon. Uh, now, now, it doesn't say whether that's attacking the police officer. It could have been attacking somebody else or drawn a weapon. Um, whereas uh, half of whites are, are listed in that category, and then he does a simple test uh, of significance and finds it's highly significant Hold difference. Hold on, two-thirds of whites and half of blacks. Attack or drew weapon. Attack right, or... I just want to be clear because you said half of whites, okay? You said whites both times. I misspoke, yes. yes. I misspoke. Two-thirds of whites and half of blacks arrested in uh, Friars Houston data yeah. were engaged in some kind of attack at the time of the arrest. That's correct. They are coded. I mean, of course, what he's done is he's used a large army of research assistants to, you, you know, to code uh, uh, from incident reports. So, so the information in inc incident reports is coded as having involved, uh, um, I think the phrasing is, uh, attacked or drew weapon. So the suspect attacked or drew weapon. Uh, in two-thirds of the cases in the white subsample of the arrest pool, but only in half of the cases in the black subsample of the arrest pool. Is that clear? Uh, yeah, so you're saying that the blacks who were arrested are probably less threatening than the whites, and therefore it may not be as surprised that the shooters, uh, that they're less rep yes, represented yes. So amongst that's the suggests, Yeah, that suggests that the blacks in the arrest pool are systematically less threatening than the whites in the arrest pool. Now, of course, Fryer understands this, right? So he wants to control for this. Um, so he uh, he runs a, a logistic regression. So he, he uses uh, information on this and all kinds of other attributes, uh, uh, you know, gender and so on and so forth. Um, and he claims that it doesn't really change the uh, the raw comparison that we just talked about a moment ago. Right. Um, it makes it insignificant, and it, depending on which variables you include. Uh, uh, actually, you know, there was an interesting blog post. I, I, unfortunately, I've forgotten the name of the individual, but who looked at the, it, this is reported in table five of the Friar paper, so people can go take a look. 
Um, if you control for these encounter characteristics that we just talked about, attacked or drew weapon, and some but not all of the other encounter characteristics, you get in table five itself the opposite effect, that, that, that blacks are more likely to be shot. Hold on. Uh, Let me interrupt for a minute just to tell people who are interested in their hearing this that they should go to your website where they can not only see your blog post, but they can also see links to some of these other things such as you've been describing. Right. And that's at Rajiv Seti, R-I-A-J-I-V-S-E-T-H-I, at uh, uh, Blogs- blogspot.com, blogspot.com, yeah. Rajiv Seti at blogspot.com. Uh, people should know that. Okay, sorry yeah. to interrupt, but I thought they should know that. Yeah. So, But I do have a question for you whenever you're finished with what you're saying. Yeah, I'm almost done. So so, so basically the, the point I'm making is that the arrest pool – um, contains two subsamples, uh, the black arrest pool and the white arrest pool, and uh, and it looks, at least just looking at the descriptive statistics, that these pools are quite different. Now, Fryer understands this. Of course, he does. And he controls for it in a particular way that's very common among economists, is to run a logistic regression. And uh, the coefficients of this regression on race, whether, you know, whether or not uh, the race of the suspect makes you more likely to be shot or less likely to be shot, they jump around quite a bit. So this was the point made by somebody else who's, who's coming at it from a statistics Jump around depending on the specification of which depending other variables are included. Correct. So if you include these encounter characteristics, the dangerousness of the sub- suspect, and some of the other characteristics but not all, you get a you get a, a anti-black bias instead of an anti-white bias in the shootings. And then if you include all of the characteristics that he has over there, you go you back to nothing. the, the yeah. quote. Yeah, yeah. So they move around quite a bit. Um, but... But my point is different. So my, my original concern was a bit different. So this is something that I think econ- neither you nor I uh, are really empirical economists in terms of what we mostly do. But we are both uh, uh, trained well enough to know that any econometric specification involves a whole host of assumptions. There are assumptions of linearity, of separability. There's assumptions about the error term, functional form. And when we say that we control for something, it is subject to those conditions. And I, you know, I, uh, when I look at that arrest pool, I see 18% female, whereas the shooting pool is 4% female. I see this large black-white difference in the degree of threat to the officer based on self-reports, based on the officer's self-reports. I see a pool that is only 5% armed, I think 4 or 5% armed, and yet about 56% are reported as having attacked or drawn weapon which suggests that there's more than half of these suspects attacked without a weapon, who were unarmed and attacked. And, you know, there are a couple of other things that I mentioned uh, in my response to this study, but the arrest pool uh, uh, um, suggests that controlling for these things adequately is of first-order importance. And so then the question to my mind is, does this way of controlling that Roland has done uh, adequately control, and there, you know, I'm I'm uh, ambivalent about it. I'm neither, you know. Okay, so let me let me push this a little bit because, as you say, we're not empirical social scientists in terms of the research that we do, but we are statistically trained social scientists. I don't feel the least bit reluctant yeah. to, to say the following. It sounds to me like so this logistic regression specification, which is meant to uh, try to identify the independent effect of the race of the arrestee on the probability that they will be a victim of a shooting by the police officer. Yes. So um, there are observed variables that can go on the right-hand side of that relationship, and then there's an error term. Yes. An assumption about being able to validly identify the independent effect of the race of the arrestee is that the variables that are not included in the regression vary in a way that is not correlated with the variables that are included in the regression. Yeah, yeah. Now, in addition, there is a selection issue. How did the individual encounter come to happen in the first place? Mm. And something has to be assumed as well about how we come to observe the particular observations that we observe being driven by processes that are not themselves influenced by race. So we need both of these things to be true. The selection process, non-racially influenced, and conditional on being in the sample, the variation of the unobserved correlates with whether or not you're shot by a police officer being independently distributed from the variation of the observed correlates that are being controlled for. We've got both of those things going on. Now, it seems to me that you're questioning both. 
In the first instance, you're questioning based upon the apparently less threatening character of the um, blacks in the arrestee population, whether or not the race of the person observed to interact with the police officers, independent of the fact that we're observing the interaction in the first place. You're yeah. questioning that. Yeah. Secondly, secondly, conditional on there being an interaction, you're questioning whether or not the things that we don't observe about that interaction are distributed in a way that's independent of the things that we do observe about that interaction. And you're saying that the conclusion drawn by Fryer in this particular study, that having controlled, quote unquote, we still find no effect of race, is much less credible in view of the fact that it's very plausible to imagine that neither of the assumptions necessary yeah. for that to be a valid statistical inference are holding true. Yes, but let That's me just... what you're saying. And I have a question about that, but I want you to respond yeah, but, to what but, I've just said. No, no, no. I think that you described my concerns, uh, 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 you know, correctly. But let me just say that I think it's a valuable study. My, my bigger concern, frankly, was the way it was characterized in the initial report by the New York Times. And also in the one, and there's one paragraph in the study itself that bothered me, which was really just taking this raw data comparison, uh, describing it as startling and then saying that it's, uh, uh, it's sustained when one controls. And given the difficulty of properly controlling for these things and given the sort of the, the very clear differences in between the arrest pool and the shooting pool, um, I felt that that was really not a, 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 well, the way I described it was an invitation to misrepresent. Now, you know, I know you thought that that was a bit unfair, but, but I, so my Water is, under the bridge, Rajiv, water under yeah, the bridge. I do believe, I do believe it's a valuable study. I think that, you know, it's asking very important questions. I think that the findings on police non-lethal use of force are consistent with earlier studies uh, um, by Jeffrey Fagan, Andrew Gelman and others. And are hugely important. We've talked about this. I think that the. I, I hope we get a chance to talk about the non-lethal use of force because, because to me that is directly linked to high homicide rates, which people cite. Yeah. Well, we, you know, I do want to have. Let me see. We've been going on for 27 minutes, so yeah. you know we're halfway. I, I do want to have an extended discussion, uh, both about the non-lethal use of force by police finding in Friar. We does see significant uh, uh, effects of race. Blacks being more likely to be subject to. Uh, right. But also, more generally, about the, the work that you and uh, your uh, colleague, uh, uh, Brendan O'Flaherty, have been doing about robbery and homicide. Uh, right. But I want to ask you a question first. Yes, go ahead. Um, and that question uh, has to do still with the general question about uh, lethal police and Friar's inferences, although I'm not tying the question specifically to our interpretation of Friar's findings. And the question has to do with, okay, so I'm back to my, I got my economist hat on and I'm trying to get back on the theme. And the theme is how would we uh, reliably use what data are available to address ourselves as scientists to the causal question of whether or not the race of the victim of the police shooting has caused in part the shooting in the yeah. sense that hypothetically, if the person hadn't been black, it wouldn't have happened. Okay, so how can we know that? So here's what I wanna say. Uh, we observe some things about the, in a, as a general matter, we can observe some things about the encounter in which a shooting does or doesn't happen, such as Fryer has, has done. But we don't observe everything. That's just a first order basic limitation on our circumstances. We're right. never going to observe everything. You, you pointed out that Fryer and his uh, students had to go over the narrative accounts written out in longhand by police officers to what is supposed to have happened in a particular arrest situation in order to distill from those, you know, 200 or 300 word uh, accounts, what variables they were going to construct in order to be able to carry out their statistical enterprise. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's extracting from a much richer milieu of encounter characteristics, which are observed by the police officer. Or, or are reported at least. I mean, uh, yeah. Well, no, no, hold on, hold on. They are observed by the police officer. He was in the situation. Then they are reported by the police officer. I'm quite prepared to agree with you that what's reported isn't necessarily what he observed. I'm right. just saying. I'm trying to pose the general statistical inference question. Right. We're going to end up with, as analysts, with data, with data. Okay, that data is going to be incomplete. One of the reasons it's incomplete is that it does not include everything that was characteristic of the encounter. And I'm trying to observe, I'm trying to uh, point out that the police officer whose actions are we're attempting to assess the causality of 
is observing things that the econometrician is not observing. That's what I'm trying to point out. He's yes. also reporting things that the econometrician is not observing. I right. agree with you about that. Still, still, at, at an inference uh, level about causation, race could be correlated with some of the things that the police officer is observing and reacting to that the econometrician is not observing. Okay? In the yeah. same way that the arrest pool in Friars Dater in Houston who are black may be less objectively threatening and that may cast aspersions in effect on whether or not the race of the person was influential in the police officers detaining them in the first place. Mm. In the same way that that's true, the race of the person could be correlated with some of the observed by police officer but not observed by the analyst characteristics of the encounter. For example, your observation that the arrest pool of blacks would appear to be less threatening than that of whites yes. could be a reflection of the fact that the arrest was undertaken by a police officer uh, in consequence of observations that he has about the encounter that we don't have, which are correlated with the race of the citizen being encountered. Right. The blacks, in other words, in plain English, could be more threatening to the police officer for reasons that are not observed by us as we attempt to assess whether or not the encounter was threatening. I am not saying this is true. I'm mm -hmm. saying it could be true. Yes, but it could be true, but one has, to, uh, one has to distinguish between encounters that are subjectively threatening from the perspective of the police officer and objectively threatening in some uh, third party sense. True, yeah. I, I agree with that. I, I want to say that that's another subject. Now, I'm quite happy to talk about it. I'm happy to talk about it now. Uh, but I'm, I'm trying to, again, zero in on how can we validly know the answer to the hypothetical and what are the assumptions involved? And whereas I'm quite prepared to agree with you that uh, the conclusion drawn in Friar's uh, study, important and valuable study, that uh, there's no uh, racial bias in the use of lethal force by the Houston Police Department uh, needs to be qualified by the observations that you've just made. Mm -hmm. I want also to say, and I'm not trying to split the difference with you, I'm not, because mm -hmm. I, I think these are deep scientific problems. And I think the, the challenge for us is to try to imagine what feasible observations we could ever have would yeah. allow us to settle with these problems. So, and, and I just want to say this and I'll stop. The reason I'm harping on the cop might see something about the encounter that we don't see is because some of these videotape and other celebrated public incidents that you have called attention to are, it seems to me, influenced by the possibility that the person in the encounter who is black is behaving differently from a way a person in that same encounter would have behaved if they hadn't been black, which has to do with their ideas about race, including the race of the police officer, not with the police officer's ideas about their race, which is the, the really important political I mean, question. Uh, yeah. uh, for example, and I'll stop, I really do want to give the example. Sandra Bland gets stopped by a cop and arrested and ends up dead in a jail cell. It's a terrible tragedy, and I'm not taking anybody's side about it. But her behavior in interacting with the cop might have been different if she hadn't been black. Likewise, Henry Louis Gates Jr. gets arrested on his doorstep in Cambridge. Again, an outcome that ought not to have happened, in my opinion. But he had discretion over how he behaved in that situation, which might be different from the way that a person would have behaved in the same situation had they not been black. For reasons that we could go into, still, I'm just trying to say, we don't we need to take those factors into account when we try to address ourselves as social scientists to this big political question? Thank you for letting me say that. Yes, we, yes, we, we do. I mean, this is a, this is what my uh, friend and colleague Dan O'Flaherty calls troubled transactions. So, you know, transactions that cross racial lines in the United States are, are troubled in all kinds of ways because of people's beliefs about other, you know, other people's beliefs and so on and so forth. We, we, we know so little about the people with whom we're interacting with, especially when they're complete strangers. And uh, so, so, you know, one way in which somebody can stereotype is to, uh, um, you know, is to uh, consider someone to be a threat if they're black, you know, when they wouldn't otherwise if they were white. Another way would be for somebody to um, ascribe to somebody else a belief <laughs> that they are threatening 
uh, because of their race. Indeed. And of course, it's going to affect interactions. So, the, you know, on, uh, there was a colleague of the officer that arrested Gates. Um, there was a there was a, a black colleague of his called Leon Lashley. <laughs> I, I wrote about this too on my blog. Uh, who, in an interview with Anderson Cooper on CNN, basically said that uh, had he been the first officer on the scene, the interaction would have played out differently. Yeah. And Anderson Cooper said, "Well, what do you mean differently?" And he didn't explain, but he said, "You know." Black man to black man, it would have just it would have just played out differently. And he was supportive of his colleague. He, it's not that he was accusing his colleague of any kind of sure. malpractice. He just felt that it would have played out differently. Sure. And when I wrote about this, you know, I was uh, I was trying to think about what he may have had in mind. And I think part of it is to do with the way in which he would have reacted to Gates. He, he, he may have been more inclined to think that he was a legitimate occupant of that house. Yeah. But part of it is also about Gates's reaction to him. Indeed. That certainly would not, or, or it's very unlikely that Gates would have ascribed to Leon Lashley the kind of racist motives that he may have uh, ascribed to the arresting officer. So, yes, definitely it's not just beliefs about violence that affect these kind of interactions. It's beliefs about racism. Um, and, uh, you know, and these beliefs can be both warranted and unwarranted. It just depends on the situation. But but in in all cases... They are, uh, um, you know, they are, uh, they are just beliefs. They, you know, they are, they are, uh, they affect your your actions, but you can never know with certainty. Okay, okay. So I want to, I want to get your reaction, and I want to. This will give us an opportunity to segue into talking about stereotypes more broadly. Uh, yeah. the, the observation you've just been making, on, uh, we've just been making, is that uh, basically blacks can have stereotypes about the police, just like the police can have stereotypes about black people. And uh, the question I want to get your or the observation I want to get your reaction to, since these stereotypes, these beliefs are to some degree influenced by evidence, but I want to argue and hear you react to there's some they are some also to some degree susceptible to discretionary manipulation. We can, as it were, choose to believe differently at some level in some sense. So uh, for to wit, the police officer can learn how to be aware of and not so reactive to whatever the sort of visceral senses of fear or uh, anticipation of uh, motive on behalf of the uh, subject of the police's arrest or whatever, he can try to be aware, you know, that race might be somehow subliminally influencing him and, and he can try to counteract that. I'm not saying it'd be perfect, but at least it's in principle possible to imagine him trying. And maybe that's a good thing to do. Uh, likewise, a citizen has, and so here's a hypothetical. I walk into a restaurant, I'm black, and I get seated at a table by the kitchen door, which yes. is noisy, okay? And there are open tables by the window. Now, I mean, I can basically experience that as an act of racism. He wouldn't have done it. What I'm saying to myself, if I had not been black, he wouldn't have done this to me. The mm -hmm. maitre d', uh, the receptionist who sat me by the, the kitchen door. And I can do that. Or I can, like, just shrug and say politely, I'm not very comfortable at this table. There's an open table by the window. Would you mind if uh, we moved over there? And at some level, it's not a cognitive problem. It's a kind of how you're going to live problem, what you choose to do in that situation. It's not as if I'm doing a statistical analysis and somehow implicitly, based on my experience, answering as a kind of uh, lay statistician the question, would this have happened to me if I'd been black? It's just that I know that stuff like this sometimes happens. If I dwell on whether or not it happened to me because I'm black, I'm going to be miserable. Uh, let me elect to say that one in 10 Mater D's is an asshole who sits people by the kitchen door when there are open tables by the window. And let me simply ask to be moved without getting into this guy's motive. Likewise, I'm stopped by a cop. I can pull out my mobile phone uh, and, uh, you know, make the cop aware of the fact that I'm susceptible to whatever, whatever. Um, or I can basically hand over my license and registration and <clears throat> not worry about being killed. I know that's crazy. And if I'm a cop, I see that the person is a young black man. I don't have to have my hand on the holstered gun as I approach the vehicle. I can mm. actually take this risk because I'm choosing to be that kind of cop. I don't know if this is crazy or not, and that's why I'm putting the question. I mean, yeah, this is, these are important issues, and I would like to respond to them, and I think I see them a bit differently uh, than you do. So let's take the restaurant example first. You're seated by the kitchen or by the bathroom. It's an unpleasant uh, uh, situation for you, and there are seats available elsewhere. Um, suppose, and this may not be how you react to it, but suppose that you are 
live it. You are upset at having been treated in that way. And you ask politely, but you contain your anger. <coughs> ask politely, if you, can be moved, you know, if you can take a, a table, an open table by the window. And uh, you are granted that. You're given the open table by the window. That, in fact, confirms your belief that there was no real reason for you to be seated by the kitchen or the bathroom in the first place. And that can make you even more livid. And the fact is that, you know, the way you respond to it, uh, 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 even if you get the superior table, it doesn't erase or eliminate. And in fact, it can reinforce the anger that you feel at the treatment that you received. Okay. Uh, on the other hand, if you are told, I'm sorry, those tables are reserved or whatever it is, that actually may actually calm you down. Uh, uh, in a sense that uh, that uh, okay, so that you know that this was not an act of racism; it was an act of uh, necessity based on some other constraint. So it's it's the, the problem is that you know even if you get what you want in a material sense, it doesn't necessarily mean that it it's comforting in a psychological sense. So it, it takes a toll. It, you know, there, there, there is the anger. The anger can persist. May, may I just say that I agree with everything you've just said, but in some way it's not responsive to my question, which is. Yes, I well may have had my belief that the cause of my being set by the kitchen table, kitchen door is my race, reinforced by being relocated to the open yes. table. And yes, were I to dwell upon the fact that the cause of my being seated by the door in, in the first place was racism, that would make me more livid. Can I, as it were, rationally or prudently yes. choose not to dwell on that hypothesis in the first place, but instead to attribute the event, whether it's true or not, to bad luck rather than to a racially invidious motive on the part of the Mater D. And that's I, a better way of living for me. That's the that's I the think, hypothesis I wanted to put forward. Yeah, I, I just think I think it's certainly possible to control one's actions, one's speech, the way one you know interacts with people far more easily than it is to control one's beliefs about attribution, um, you know, one's view of the world. I mean, you know, that's that's something that, you know, we can get into this, this debate at some point. Uh, the, the degree of freedom that I have to change what I believe is much more limited, I would say, than the freedom I have to change my actions. The way well, I what, what I would say is that at some level, a definition of ideology is precisely a pre-commitment about otherwise conditional belief. That is, I lock myself in to adhering to causal accounts that are to some degree not immediately responsive to fluctuating evidence, that are at some level chosen independently of the evidence, if you like, prior to the evidence. And that, and that a way of being black in the world, since that's what we're talking about now, it can apply to other groups and other settings a way of carrying that identity and interpreting what happens to one at an ideological, not an evidentiary level, can be contrasted here. One of them is precisely live it, live it all the time, okay? Attendant in great uh, uh, detail and with fer ferocity to such evidence as reinforces my view, objectively validated by the facts at hand, that discrimination is happening to me. And another, quote, ideology, close quote, which I might be inclined to embrace in 2016, but certainly would not have embraced in 1965, is to say, until, in some sense, uh, overwhelmingly proven to the contrary, I'm not going to look under every rock and interpret every affront through the narrative lens of my victimization on the part of my race. Being seated by a table in a restaurant is seeing that in the small. Opening the newspaper and learning that a black man has been shot by a police officer is seeing it in the large. And uh, getting to a university campus and going first to the Africana Studies Department, because that's where I'll feel comfortable, is yet again seeing the world through a particular ideological lens. To the extent that we want a multiracial democracy that's healthy and robust, we should be encouraging, not mainly, not first of all amongst African-American demonstrators or angry middle-class, middle-aged African-Americans seated by the restaurant tables. That wouldn't be where I'd start to try to uh, shut a scuttle racist and racially tinged ideological pre-commitments. I wouldn't start there. 
I'd start with police officers, with white supremacists, with uh, powerful government agencies that indirectly reinforce racial division and things of that kind. I'd start with the political rhetoric of, of a Republican Party and other such places that are also located in the space of racial injury. I wouldn't start with Black Lives Matter, but I would certainly have them on the list. Okay, thank you for enduring that. Well, Ide ideology being a pre-commitment about belief uh, in the context of the earlier discussion. Um, I don't think that people who are livid at being seated by the kitchen uh, uh, view their anger as being anything other than evidence-based. They, 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 they feel that it's happened to them a few times. And, uh, uh, you know, whether or not, you know, from some perspective of a third party it is or is not, I don't think it is viewed as, as an, you know, particularly ideological belief. It's, it's, it's a parsing of evidence. Now, of course, the way in which we process evidence is identity specific. It's based on stories we've heard growing up and so on and so forth. So, you know, it's, 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 it's hard to separate priors, what, what, what we in Bayesian statistics call priors from, from uh, uh, information. But nevertheless, the, per, the subjective perception is that this is just a reaction to information rather than rather than ideology. But let me talk about the police thing uh, uh, um, uh, also. You mentioned the cases of Sandra Bland and, and Henry Louis Gates, where you, you seem to suggest that, you know, had they reacted in a more passive way towards the arresting officers uh, or, to, or, or to the officers, that uh, that they would uh, they would not have ended up either of them being arrested. And that may well be true. But there's also, to counter that, there's also the so-called talk, which, of course, you know, I mean, you've heard about from Eric Holder and so on and so forth, where, where people are told specifically, no matter what you believe about why you're being stopped, no matter how awful you think the officer is behaving, um, you behave in a way that is uh, hyper compliant, that, that, that is far more compliant than a white person would behave in that situation because you face a greater danger. And so some interactions are certainly affected by this this talk. I, I, I believe that if you think that if you think that some interactions with police are, uh, um, uh, you know, overly confrontational because of a reaction to perceived racism, and I believe that in some cases that will be true, there are also a whole bunch of interactions, I think, that go in the opposite direction, where you might be very, very upset, but you still follow a certain protocol because you want to uh, uh, walk away with your life. So, so I don't think one can presume that reactions between black drivers, let's say, who are stopped and police, as compared with reactions by white drivers who are stopped, are necessarily more aggressive or hostile uh, than, you know, uh, in one case rather than the other. I think it could go either way. And uh, uh, these two cases don't really tell us a whole yeah. lot. about. No, uh, I agree with that. I want to I want to correct something. No, I, I'm not saying if they had been more passive. I'm saying if they had been more civil. Uh, Rajiv, I'm not saying passive. I'm saying civil. I think, Glenn. Uh, no, no, I think... I, hold on. Just let me let me make this point, if I may. Okay. Uh, I'm not asking for black passivity. Okay. I'm asking for citizenship. You know, when the police it's... officer asks you to produce your identification, you don't have to give him back lip. You can simply hand over your ID. This is one of the things. That, I mean, this is you are taking away. If you if you're asking for this, you are taking away one of the. One of the luxuries of living in a free society, one of the one of the things that we enjoy in a free society is to say things that are maybe offensive to others, that may be wrong, that may be, you know, that may be awful things to say or do. And honestly, you know, if you are saying that, look, uh, uh, were you to curtail your instincts, uh, your, your, your tendencies to do this, you'd, 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 you'd be more likely to survive. No, no, no this is what I'm saying. Here's exactly I, that happens to be true, but that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, if the question before us is, has the police officer treated somebody differently because of their race, then as social scientists, the possibility that the race of the person subject to police discretion may influence the way they interact with the police officer needs to be taken into account. And in the cases at hand about Sandra Bland and Henry Louis Gates Jr., on the surface it would appear that their reactions to the police officer was influenced by their race and causally entailed in the outcome of those interactions, such that the conclusion that the police officers in either case acted differentially because of the race of the person needs to be held in far abeyance. It's by no means obviously true. 
I'm not asking African Americans to surrender their rights of citizenship, but I am saying to the extent that they're in civil in interactions with police officers, then causally the frequency with which those interactions have bad outcomes will be greater. And moreover, the conclusion that that's the case because the police officer treated them differently by, because of their race will be invalid. That's what I'm saying. Uh, the way that I think we should respond to that situation, if it, if it exists, is to, is, to, is to tell our police officers that, that you know, they should respond to incivility with excess civility. There is nothing wrong, nothing wrong with insisting that our police officers treat the most hardened criminals, no matter how convinced they are of the appalling nature of the crimes that somebody may have committed, to refer to them as sir or ma'am to give them the utmost courtesy, to apologize for taking their time, to apologize for stopping them. This seems to me something that is very low cost. Low cost, it's, it, you know, it goes against the you know, instinctive you know, inclination to treat somebody badly if you think that they are a criminal. But we have to demand this of our police officers. You know, th this is the way in which one, I think, ought to deal with what you call, you know, giving somebody lip or, or treating somebody in, 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 without, without civility. I actually believe, for reasons that I've already alluded to, I don't want to repeat myself, that a lot of the, a lot of the reactions from people who are stopped uh, are excessively civil, excessively passive in the sense that, the, the, you know, they, they, they are following a certain protocol that they have been taught to follow. Uh, and, and I think that you're talking about two cases which are in some sense uh, uh, they, they, I, I suspect it arises quite frequently, but I don't think I, I, I wouldn't uh, uh, say that this would be the norm. But we can't we can't know this. No, we can't resolve that here. I, I, I agree. I agree I with you about that. And I'm not I'm not saying I just want to be clear for the record. I'm not saying, quote, blacks bring it on themselves, close quote. Again, I'm, I'm trying to discipline someone, someone how we draw conclusions about police motives from the fact that right. these altercations. But I think I honestly think, you know, being rude to a police officer, however imprudent it may be and risky it may be. Is you know, is a right and a luxury that we should all have, regardless of race. I disagree and, with that. I disagree with that. Uh, no. And this has nothing to do with race, as you say. I disagree with the fact that we have the right to be rude to police officers. I think we have an obligation to be civil with police officers. I think what we have a right to is, in the event that we are rude to police officers, to be dealt with in a professional and civil manner by the police officer in response to our rudeness. I'd go that far. But I, I think, think I think we bad. basically have an obligation to cooperate with police officers. I don't understand how one can be a citizen in a republic in which there is the necessity to have police officers on behalf of public goods, publicly agreed upon goals, and there not be. Uh, it's almost like we ha we don't have an uh, obligation to pay our taxes. We have a right to uh, oh. not pay taxes. <laughs> I mean, no, what no is, we don't have a right to not. What pay kind taxes. of behavior are you really talking about? You're talking about somebody who's sulky. Who's, who's lighting a cigarette, who's huffing and puffing, who's upset at being stopped for no reason at all, uh, you know, for changing lanes without signaling, uh, or, or who's being arrested in their own home. Surely, surely, you know, these are, these are not things that, do, do we have an obligation to, to, to suppress our emotions in this case? I, I, I think in the same way that the police officer, when arresting a person who might be armed and suspected of having done something heinous, as you've just asserted, should say, sir, you are yeah. under arrest. In the same way, the person who has been stopped for a traffic violation and approached by an officer of the law should not blow smoke in the officer's face for the same reasons. Smoking in your vehicle is... Blow is... smoke in the face, Rajiv. Please don't change the subject. Civility <laughs> was the question. The question was whether or not the person has a right to be in civil to a police officer. You and I disagree about that. I've just reinforced why me, I think me, so. Let me state it in this way, Glenn. I'm happy to, to agree to disagree, but let me state it in this way. I'm not advocating incivility by any means. I am saying that we have a right to be incivil without being, uh, 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 without incurring harsh retaliation from it at the hands of the police. That's what I'm saying. I think that I'm not suggesting anybody be incivil. I'm just suggesting that that, you know, incivility should not be grounds for wrongful arrest. It should not be grounds for violence on the part of law enforcement. It should not be, uh, you know, it should, it should not be grounds for even retaliation. Um, I, I think it's prudent to be civil. Uh, I think it's it's the right thing to do in some sense, but it should not have the kind of consequences that you are you are uh, 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 that, that in these two cases that it had.
Oh, we're back to the cases of well, San, Sandra Bland and Henry Louis Gates. I, well, the, I, know, I thought they were not representative. I, but anyway, okay, let, let's uh, try to use the last uh, few minutes uh, that we have here. I don't want to tax our uh, viewers unduly or your time. Uh, for you to talk about what you want to talk about uh, in terms of uh, stereotypes. Uh, and I know, I'm, I'm sorry, maybe we should just have another conversation, but but let me give over to you an opportunity to shift to ground that you want to discuss. Let me let me just mention something that I found interesting in your conversation with Peter Moskos um, and uh, some of the things that he's been writing on his blog. So, so, so there, there have been two kinds of reactions from people who find Roland Fry's results unsurprising. There's one group of people who think that police can do no wrong. And here I would classify Rudy Giuliani, for example, a few of the police chiefs uh, that have made statements about this kind of thing. Sure, sure. Uh, and and they, think, they think that, yeah, yeah, we have police killings, but, uh, you know, uh, um, it's almost always the case that there were reasonable actions on the parts of the police, that whether they were threatened or not, that they were reasonable to believe that they were threatened, that there's no racial bias uh, to speak of, that the video evidence is selective and uh, ambiguous, uh, and in the few cases where it may not be, those are the rare exceptions that move the rule. So this is one group of people who are unsurprised by Fry's findings, the group that just, I would summarize as those who think the police can do no wrong, uh, uh, for the most part. Okay. Then there's another group, and this, and here I include uh, Peter Moskos, who, who explicitly said that he was unsurprised by, by Fry's findings. But his reasons are really quite different. It's not that he thinks that police can do no wrong. It's that he believes that the police are often doing things that are wrong that result in the death of whites. And so you will get in the aggregate data, you will get a lot of whites wrongfully killed. And he's got a long list of this on his blog. And you've talked about this with John McWhorter, who's written a piece in Time about it. Right. And to me, it's important to distinguish between these two reactions. The reaction that says, oh, Fry's findings are, uh, are unsurprising because of, uh, uh, you know, because you have these differences in crime rates, differences in, uh, uh, you know, threat levels, and the police are essentially doing a good job, and we should just, pat, you know, congratulate them. And, and this is not a cause for concern. And, and the group that say, look, there's, some, there's something very, very wrong with policing in America today, but it's also having a big impact on some white communities. And I thought about this a bit, and, and my latest post actually actually speaks to this point, because I was thinking about how Moscow's can be so convinced in his own mind that the Castile shooting would not have occurred had the driver been white, and at the same time say that he's unsurprised by Fry's findings. I mean, it would appear to be inconsistent. And this is what my last post was about. And when I looked at this, when I looked at the data that he had on his blog, and then I looked at this report from the Center for Policing Equity, which was recently released, what jumped out at me, and this is, I think, a, you know, a staggering fact that I think deserves more discussion uh, than it's getting, is that you have huge regional differences in, yeah. in yeah. police killings, massive California versus New York, Philadelphia, uh, California on the one hand versus New York, Philadelphia, uh, New York, Pennsylvania, and Michigan on the other. Moscow's, Moscow's discussed this in my conversation with him. Yeah. Yes. So you get these massive regional differences. Now, the way that I, I uh, uh, interpret these regional differences is that training and selection and protocol, these things matter a great deal. Uh, it's, you know, he says it's not that the threat levels to police are very different in these different areas. The police are acting differently under similar conditions. Okay. And this is something really, really important to consider. Now, is this fact, for, first of all, this seems to refute to some extent that police killings are simply a response, a response to threat levels. You wouldn't expect, you'd expect variations that are regional variations to then be responsive to regional variations in crime. That's not what we're seeing. Yeah, we're seeing much yeah. more idiosyncratic regional vari yeah. variations in police killings. Now, the fact that there are an awful lot of whites being killed, this is a very, very important fact to acknowledge. Yeah. The fact that so many whites are being killed, and if you look at the aggregate data, this is a point that Sendil Molenathan made in the New York Times a few months ago. Um, roughly speaking, the proportion of uh, blacks in the shooting uh, uh, data are roughly comparable to the proportion of arrests in the arrest data. This, this is where Fryer starts his Houston analysis, in fact. So yeah. Sendil made, this, made a similar point. And what I tried to do in my last post is to say, look, can we have simultaneously this being true, that you know whites are being killed at very high rates as well as blacks, and the, the killings roughly correspond to the arrests. 
yeah. and at the same time have bias of the kind that Moscow thinks he sees yes. in the incident. And the answer is really quite straightforward. I, I, I discussed it on my blog. Yes, of course. It's- it, is that, it, is that, it is that, you know, it is that whites in America appear to be exposed to more poorly trained police on average. So basically, you know, you have in regions of the country where you have a, a, a large, uh, uh, a disproportionately large share of whites in the encounter population with police is where you seem to have the largest rate of police killings. And so there may be bias. This is the point I made in the blog with a simple example. You may have bias in encounters in all locations. So conditional encounters, you get more killing of blacks in every location. Right. And yet when you add them all up together, you may not see it. So that, Can that's, I just explain to the viewers that the reason that that happens yeah. is because although blacks could be hypothetically more exposed to police violence in every region of the country, yes. if they are disproportionately located in those regions of the country in which the level Overall, yeah. of police violence is lower. Yeah. Then, when you aggregate, you may see no disparity in the rate at which blacks experience police violence yeah. overall. Notwithstanding the fact that in every single location where police are being violent, blacks are more likely to experience that violence. Yeah. Yeah. That's the and point, and it's a very, lo- it's a very <laughs> lovely, very shelling esque point, I must say, Rajiv. I mean, and this is where I am right now. This is what I believe. I believe that there's there ought to be a lot of discussion about the police killing. Of course, of and excuse me. Roland's finding is specific to a particular region of the country, right. and therefore your observation doesn't apply in that case. But go no, on. No, no, it doesn't. No, no. We, but we've discussed all this length. Yes. Yeah, that's right. And I think that this ought to be linked a little bit to the findings of Case and Deaton on life expectancy among whites. Uh, uh, you know, the one group in America that has been experiencing um, a flattening or uh, or an even a decline in life expectancy. Um, and that, that was a study that attracted a lot of attention as well. There, yes. there, there's, a, there's a lot of suffering among some white communities in the United States that Case and Deaton study, you know, isolates. And if you look at the data, this is the last thing, and then I'll stop. I know we're both out of time. Yes. If you look at, and this is something that we've discussed before and we're writing about, actually. If you look at female incarceration over the last decade and a half, right. you, have a, you have a staggering 50% increase in white female incarceration, while there's a 30 to 40 percent decline in black female incarceration. It, it, it's, you know, of course, women are only about uh, six or seven percent at most of the incarcerated population. But if within that within that group, something really quite extraordinary yeah. is happening to white women relative to black. And I think that these issues need further discussion, maybe on your on your show or elsewhere. But uh, but, uh, uh, you know, thinking about these things, talking about them, reflecting on them. Uh, um, doesn't necessarily contradict what I think is, uh, uh, is is the basic premise that's animating the Black Lives Movement, is that there is bias. Well, uh, the two well, things are not inconsistent in my mind, is what I'm trying to say. No, fine, and, and uh, let me just take this privilege, if you will, just to have a final word, which is to say, doesn't counteract, but raises an ideological question in the sense in which I referred to ideology earlier, about how politically appropriate and over the long term constructive it is to focus on that disparity, given the big fact that the whites are disproportionately subject to bad policing. That's a massively significant thing to be saying in the days of Black Lives Matter, that that whites are distributed around the country regionally in such a way that they are disproportionately located in districts where the police are disproportionately likely to use lethal violence. That's a yeah. massively significant thing to say, that the life expectancy of, of uh, certain uh, education class located white people is declining. That's a massively significant political thing for Black Lives Matter to take on board. That um, uh, I, I, the number I, of people incarcerated, just to finish the point, amongst yeah. women has been declining for blacks and significantly increasing for whites in recent years. I thought yeah. we were against mass incarceration, okay? Yeah. So if the ideology is racially defined and yet the phenomenology yeah. is transracial, there is a problem. That's, that doesn't negate the observation of racial bias, but right. it puts it in the backseat if you're going to be serious 
of our political reform. That's Glowry's conclusion, which I don't expect you to agree with, but at least uh, you gave me the I, chance to yeah, state. I, just, I, I mean, I, I agree with some of it. I don't, I don't agree with the backseat characterization, but I, you know, I think these both things matter because intent matters. You know, and I think we ex- should expect a lot from our, our law, law enforcement agencies. Um, and, and I really do believe that we should act in concert to address these two issues, and they are linked. Um, and it's unfortunate that the conversation is bifurcated. And, and in fact, it's bifurcated in a very, very unpleasant way. Uh, you know, you have really, uh, you know, very different uh, uh, appeal to appeal, you know, to very different uh, uh, sentiments yeah. among our politicians and very different political parties are yeah. addressing, yeah. you know, one concern related to the other. Yeah, yeah. When in fact, there ought to be unity. There ought to be unity in addressing these problems. There, there, there I think we agree. Indeed, we do agree, and I, I saw the same convention that you saw last week, and so I know I know of whereof yeah. you speak. Thank you, Rajiv, very much for coming on, and uh, we have so much. many things to talk about, so uh, <laughs> I look forward to talking more with you sh- shortly. Okay, Glenn, bye-bye. Okay, bye.